<laughs> Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. I am Elizabeth and I'm the events coordinator at Gibson's Bookstore and I am very pleased to have with us this evening R.A. Salvatore and Terry Brooks. We are here to celebrate the release of Bob's new book, Relentless. We are very excited for this. This was an event that we had planned slightly differently in the before, which is what I'm calling before COVID. Um, yeah. In the before, we had Terry with a new book who was coming to New Hampshire and Bob was going to be in conversation with him. Terry, your book got pushed back to the fall. And so now we have Bob's book and Terry's in conversation with you. So we are so pleased that because of technology, we could still have the two of you in conversation. I've been trying to get you two in the same room for an event for years. So I'm really excited to have you guys on my computer screen. All at the same time, we have about 200 people here talking to you and, and hearing you two. You guys are old friends. Um, so welcome everybody to this amazing event tonight. Uh, let's get started. Bob, your new book is Relentless. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, this, uh, this series was, I didn't think I was gonna get to write this series. It's something I've been planning for about 10 years, well, seven years anyway, but after when I did the Homecoming series, that's when Wizards of the Coast decided they were gonna stop publishing books. And I went, oh well, you know, I didn't get to say what I needed, to, I felt I needed to say, but then they let me license the character. And I got, I started working with Harper Collins, Harper Voyager. And, uh, you know, I still work with Wizards of the Coast, but I got to tell this story. And it was important to me because it allowed me to go back in time and kind of expand on the, the dark elf city and on that culture, which I think is it really, it was really important for me to do that, to show what really goes on in that city behind the scenes. And then also to keep going with the story in front because I'm finally after 33 years now, um, that main character is finally getting to where I wanted him to be. And so I get to tie it up in Relentless where we see kind of the evolution of a lot of the different characters to the to the point where I needed them to be. Uh, makes me very happy. I'm not gonna do any spoilers here, but it's, it was, I think I surprised a lot of people with some of the things in this book, which is good. So um, as you just mentioned, no spoilers. So guys in the chat, try and keep everything spoiler free. We're gonna do our very best to be spoiler free. Um, I do have a question about that, uh, about, about your books, Bob. Um, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? No, I'm a total pantser. <laughs> so do your characters surprise you or um, how? Every page, every page. No, really. I, um, when I wrote The Crystal Shard, for example, it, at the end of the book, I said, I really like doing this. So what can I do at the end of the book? Then maybe they'll give me another one. So I introduced this character, Adamus and Trary. He shows up in the town, the halfling sees him. It's all you see at the very end of the book, the halfling sees him and goes, Oh no, because he's an assassin coming to get him, and this guy is legendary. And I just left it at that. I didn't even know if I had another book. And so I figured the next book I'd kill him. That would be the showdown. That would be he would be the big bad guy in the next book, Screams of Silver. That was in 1988. I wrote Screams of Silver. He's not only still around, he's a major character still. Um, so they surprise me all the time. I, I do outline because I want to have a general idea. I don't want to get lost in space here, you know. And there are things I know thematically I want to do. Like I said, the things that are in this book, and it's the only thing I'll say about that is th this was the perfect time in the real world for Relentless to release for me because it says the things I want to say. But I began this whole arc back with The Companions, which I came out in 2013, I believe. So I knew where it was going thematically. Um, I know the general story when I sit down and write a book. I have to write an outline or they won't send me a check. And I want my checks. So I, I do write an outline. Then they write, send me the check. I throw my outline away and I get to work. And the characters take me on the journey. I'm a complete pantser. I don't know what's going to happen on the next page half the time. I love it that way. It makes it fun. Bob, what about you? Are you a plotter? Uh, Terry, what about you? Are you a plotter or a pantser? If you're going to start confusing us, I'm going to be very upset. Um, 
Well, you know, I used to be, uh, I used to be a, a, a hey, what do you mean by that? Wait player. a minute. Time out. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be, I tried to teach Bob about this, but I, I'm afraid I failed miserably. Mm -hmm. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, I used to be a plotter, but, uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, that was back in the 70s. And since then, I've evolved into kind of a different state uh, of thinking. And I still do some outlining, but I'm more inclined to go by the seat of my pants or instinct now than I used to be. Uh, and uh, I was going to talk about Bob with this a little later, but I'll say a couple words about this. Uh, since I've got all this time, and I have not only all this time, I have three books ready to go. Right? Turn them in. They're all set. Post to publish. Along comes COVID and shoots everything. And I've got all this time now with nothing to do. So one day I sat down and started doing my usual doodling around because I can't do anything if I don't write. And I have to write. And I wrote this one line. It said, at midnight, they broke out just as they had planned. And I thought about that for a while. I thought, well, who broke out? Where did they break out from? And that led to the whole book that I wrote in about three months. So, you know, I'm now gone. I guess I'm, I've been won over by Bob in terms of uh, the way I like to approach books now. Yes, you see, he talking about him teaching me, but look where he is now. We, he can, all learn. <laughs> we can all learn from each other. It's absolutely true. Um, so how about you guys tell me about writing fight scenes? Do you guys like to write fight scenes or like, I know that some people love them. Some people hate them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is a resounding, I can't think of anything and I like to write more and Bob is even worse than me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I played hockey all my life, so it's just natural. <laughs> uh, no, I, I love writing battle scenes. To me, that's the dance, you know, that's the, that's the payoff for a lot of things in, in these books. I, I like, I like to eat my, my entire writing style changes when I'm in a battle scene, the, the verb to be disappears, the sentences get shorter, the paragraphs get shorter. And as the fight gets this faster parts, the writing gets faster. But, you know, if I'm doing word count and I'm going, you know, I got to do a thousand words today. If it's a battle scene, 5,000 words later, I'll say, did I hit a thousand yet? because I just get completely lost in it. And I enjoy it. I enjoy, um, I enjoy the choreography of it. And I enjoy, especially if it's a larger scale battle where I can really you know, focus on the movements and the tactics of the battle, it, it challenges me. So yeah, I love it. The, uh, the comment chat section right now is just waxing poetic about your fight scenes, Bob, I have to say. Um, everybody, everybody loves them. By the way, one of the things that made me really want to write fight scenes was Wish Song of Shano. Oh, yeah. Because I was so mad at you, with Garrett <laughs> Jacks. You didn't show me that fight. I wanted to see that fight with the daemon up on the cliff, on the ledge. And then we just see him, and he's lying there, and he's almost dead. And I'm like, where's that missing a chapter? I'm missing a chapter. That, great. That was a whole idea. We don't know if he died or not. It's always been something of a mystery as to whether he escaped, and we I didn't hope you know did. it. I love that character. <laughs> but your fight scenes are terrific. You know, you're probably as good as anybody out there that I can think of right now. So, I think you finally mastered something. Oh, I mean, mastered. You gotta have different. something in your resume. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know uh, if Bob is. You know, I'm at the end of my. Uh, Shannara career here with this next book. That's the end of it. And uh, that will be, I think, 30, 30 books. And Bob's already ahead of me, I believe, with the Dritz series. So do you have any thoughts about how many more you might write? Or you think you'll just keep writing them until whatever? I always said I'd write it as long as I was enjoying writing it and people were enjoying reading it. I'm not so sure anymore. I'm still enjoying the heck out of writing it. If it ends at Relentless, then that would be okay with me. Yeah, I think because I, I knew what I had to do. And there might be one more thing I want to do. And then that if I do that, it'll probably lead me to more things I want to do and I'll just keep going. So I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I would I would have said absolutely not. I'm going to do it as long as they let me three, four years ago. No, I'm not so sure. I, I'm I'd be so disappointed. Sure. I'd be disappointed if you told me you knew. Well, as, as long as... 
I do what? I, that I want to quit or that I want to keep going? No, if you told me you had decided to quit and this was going to be it. Well, I the only thing is there's things there. That, there are things I want to accomplish mm -hmm. in Demon Wars. Mm -hmm. That's my world, and I love it. And The Coven was one of my favorite series that just finished up this year mm -hmm. with uh, Song of the Risen God. And if to keep doing two books a year with six grandkids <laughs> and two coasts and a life I really want to live. And, you know, I lost six months of it this year with this stupid COVID thing. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I on the other hand, I, I got to tell you the things I get from readers that are saying, please don't stop because these characters become like friends to them. And I understand that too. And so it's like John Fogarty. Remember John Fogarty went out on his own and he wouldn't play any Creedence Clearwater Revival songs. And then he realized, because people kept calling for them, but he wouldn't do it because of a dispute he had had with the manager or the band or whatever. Yeah. And then he realized that sometimes it's not just about him. It's about the people who are re uh, oh, listening music. to his music, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you say you're done with Shannara, but I'm not so sure. Well... You I'm not, gonna I've ask never been, I don't tell the truth a whole lot. <laughs> no, I remember I met you in what, 1990, 91? Yeah, back with that the, was your last book tour. Heritage. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. <laughs> and you said, this is my last to, uh, book tour. I can't do this Massachusetts. anymore. Was in Massachusetts? Bob came out to a, a mall signing I was doing. I think it was probably a Walden Books or something like that. It was like for that. Science. It was it with Science? See, first it was book. Science. And I uh, introduced himself. I said, well, I already know who you are. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I handed you was, a copy of Sojourn, of a I think. Great relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, handed, I handed him a copy of Sojourn. You did. And you, you said, Dark Elf, I love this. And I won't use the word because we're public. <laughs> and uh, and it's, been, it's been just an amazing friendship. And, and I got to tell you, Terry's taught me an awful lot about the business side of the business and about the writing side of the business. And I'm forever grateful to this man. And I'm not the only author that says that, by the way. Terry takes authors under on, his huh? wing like a, I don't know, like a mother hen. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Let me think about that image. Yeah. I just want to say uh, with Relentless, um, this is a terrific book, but not only that, but PW gave you a starred review, which is hard to get if you're in our, in our area of, of uh, writing. So yeah, I thought it was pretty proud cool. of that. I actually tweeted about that because I was shocked, and I, was, I thought it was pretty cool that the 36th book in a series got a stat review. Well, it took you a while, but you know. <laughs> no, that was the first one. Now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was funny, and uh, it, it, it's it's nice to know that the, the books are still making sense, and I think that's because I use the books to make sense of the world. So my characters keep growing because I keep growing. My characters keep looking for new things because I keep looking for new things. And it seems to be working. So that's, that's pretty cool. I don't know a lot of people that can say they've done 30 plus books with the same characters. Arthur Conan Doyle, me, and uh, who else? Uh, How about Piers Anthony? Did he get to 30? I don't think so. Not I don't the same think characters, so. I don't think. I haven't heard from him in a while anyway. Harry so maybe we, maybe we own this field. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to look up how many books Discworld had with Terry Pratchett. He might be. Yeah, quite a few. So I have, um, would you guys ever consider writing a book together? We talked about it once. Terry had done Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. And I had done Attack of the Clones. And we talked about doing the third one together. Mm -hmm. um, as far as writing just a novel together, if I... There are probably three people in the world I would do that with. Terry would be one of them. But I don't know that our friendship would survive it because <laughs> I'm super protective of my work. I think I'm it sure would be very work. hard. Um, yeah. it, it's a rare situation where two writers can work together without tearing each other's heads off. And uh, because we all are, are very pr protective of the areas we work in and the characters we do. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we did it, one of us would end up writing the book and the other would just be have his name on the book. <laughs> one of us would write the book and the other would write the fight scenes. <laughs> yeah, write the fight scenes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your characters would do if they found themselves in the other's world? <laughs> 
Oh, well, that would depend on the characters, I suppose, first of all. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I well, never even considered that. Well, if Dritz found himself in Shannon and Terry was writing it, he'd run because Terry would kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dritz versus the Warlock Lord. All right. No, Perfect. Dritz versus Garrett Jacks. That would be, I'd write that. I would write that scene. <laughs> be a good fight scene, boy. We have a comment here, someone saying, write two sides of the same story, approach an event from different perspectives. Maybe. Terry can't afford me. <laughs> you guys got very introspective all of a sudden, so maybe we planted a seed, guys. Uh, Terry uh, Pratchett, by the way, has 41 books in Discworld. Are they all the same character? No, they're not. They, they follow different characters. I, I said character. That's true. James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, Grits. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Fair point. Okay, so uh, we have- Oh, wait, wait, I'm wrong. Captain Kirk. <laughs> Captain Kirk. <laughs> Luke. He doesn't count. Han, Leia, I'm wrong. <laughs> Dragon Lance, I'm wrong. Different authors, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, yeah. So we a question from Lucia. Um, Bob, how or where do you come up with those interesting and sometimes unusual names for the characters? And what culture or country are they based from? I close my eyes. I hit the keyboard and hope enough vowels pop up. So there. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I know that's took, not true. I kind of took the Tolkien Elvish and the, the Dwarven Brogue and kind of figured the dark elves underground. So they, they kind of like, you know, you got some dwarf stuff going on there with the mining and all that. So I, I kind of mixed them together. So I tried to use the Tolkien rhythms for elves and throw in the hard consonant sounds for dwarves. And, and then kind of came up with my own language in the middle. But one of the things I do in my books, and I do it all the time, is when I'm, I want history to rhyme and I want people to kind of recognize things so like when I'm writing in Demon Wars, if I'm doing, like in the new books, there's a race called the Jokanai. And I'm actually using a different earth language on my English to that language translator to come up with word meanings. And then I'm messing with it a little bit to go. Because I'm not a linguist, I'm not Tolkien, but I love language. I, I love hearing it. I love, you know, just reveling in it. Um, whenever I see hear someone speaking a language I don't know, I'm like, where where are you from? Where is that from? Because I love it. So I, I play with things like that. And so, you know, sometimes I'll, like my dwarves will become either Cockney English or Scottish half the time. Uh, Guinevar in, you know, Dritz Panther Companion, that's the Celtic spelling for King Arthur's Queen. Um, things like that. Um, but I do, I do... The internet is a wonderful tool. It's, it, it's a curse and a blessing. And the blessing part of it is I can look up translators and go to other languages and find the rhythm of that language and incorporate it in what I do. When I did the draw, though, I didn't have the internet. That was before the internet. So I just, um, like I said, I took the Tolkien Elvish and the hard consonants of the Dwarven names and kind of rolled them together. Back, uh, back before the internet, uh, Bob doesn't actually go back that far, but I do. 87? Uh, back before. <laughs> what message know, were you on in 1987? Bob, you're only 50. Uh, yeah, sure. Anyway, uh, back, back in the old days when we actually went to bookstores and had uh, signings with lines and so forth, I used to get names from people in line. Uh, yeah. I did that all the time, and I would ask them if I could use their name, and they would pretty much always say yes. And so I'd put it aside and added to my list. And uh, more than once I've used names to people who, uh, who you know, came through and just by chance I liked their name and thought I could do something with it. And I think that's what we're looking at. And it is a mix of how does it look on the page and how does it sound in your head uh, as much as anything else when you say it. Because sometimes you don't even say it the way that the person who you stole it from says it. Yep. So you have to decide how you want that to go. But I think that's a good source. But you can't do it like real world, right? I just got done watching the Tudors again, oh. right? Uh, King Henry VIII and that. Half the people in the court were named Thomas. Yes. You well, can't they, do that in books. They're English. <laughs> Henry, English. You, know. you have Thomas talking to Thomas, talking to Thomas, you got a problem. Yeah. Thomas and Charles, there you go. There's half of England. Yep. 
So do you want to give the fans a brief pronunciation guide on some of the names and places in your in your books? Never. No. The reason I, I wouldn't I, do it is because of Dune. I, I love Dune. I loved Dune. And I always said Baron Harkonnen. And then I saw the movie and it said Harkonnen. And it like, I couldn't, it like threw me all over the place. It, it just, I couldn't do it. So well, isn't, um, that the re isn't that the reason we don't do glossaries also uh, with names or lists of names uh, with pronunciations? I've never thought that was a good idea because the person who's reading the book is the one who adopts the name the way they feel it ought to be spoken. And right. why should you take that away from them say, by saying, oh, well, you have to pronounce it this way. I don't think that's anywhere near as much fun as if you just let it go. Well, I agree. And I, I, even in audio books, I've seen, heard them pronounce things differently than I would. Because they'll call me, you know, Victor Bravine or, or Tim yeah. Gerard Reynolds will call me and say, well, how do you say this name? And I say, how do you say this name? And they do like, yeah. well, that's perfect. <laughs> do you want to tell the story, Bob, about Pickle? Oh, that was different. Yeah, Pickle was different. Uh, what, yeah, when I was... Uh, when I was finishing up the Halfling's Gem, they said, you got to finish this up because the people are tired of these characters. This was 1988 or 89, and we're going to want something different. So I had to tie it up at the end. I had to come up with a bunch of dwarves real quick because they had to take over Mithril Hall in the, in the epilogue of the book. And so I came up, with, came up with what I thought was the best dwarf name ever, General Dagnabbit. And I, Dagnabbit's like the best dwarf name ever for Forgotten Realms. And um, so I did it and the book went through and my editor caught a bunch of grief from the other people up at TSR for using that name. And he got really mad at me. And he's like, I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, why not? It was, that's a great dwarf name. You can't do that. You know, it's, you're making fun of it. And I'm like, I'm making fun of the dwarf in the book. Okay, they, that's the kind of names they have. It's funny and they're, they're but then anyway, we had this big fight and he made me change it to Dagna and it really ticked me off. So I turned Dagna into his son <coughs> or his father. I don't remember how I did it, but then I reintroduced Dagnabbit and I also added <laughs> Dagnabet, who's the queen of Mithril Hall. So, you know, to you editor. Um, but after that, I had gone on to the cleric quintet and I had to come up with two, two dwarves and they said, I'm thinking, well, Ivan works, you know, Ivan and someone, his brother, the Boulder Shoulder Brothers. And so I came and I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I want to burn Eric. So I said, so I came up with P-I-K-E-L. And I sent the book in and I waited by my phone. You know, a couple of days later, I just had my phone right there ready because I knew Eric was going to call screaming. And sure enough, he picks it up. He, and he calls, I, I pick it up and I'm like, hey, Eric, how you doing? He says, Pickle. I say cucumber. He said pickle. I said tomato. What is this? Is a salad recipe? What are you doing? He said you have a dwarf named Pickle. I said what are you talking about? He said do you have a dwarf pickle? Ivan's brother pickle. I said no no no. That's pike all like the weapon. Oh okay never mind. He's got green hair. He's a pickle. <laughs> but I did it just to burn Eric. Much ado about nothing, right? I, he forgave me. I think I drew, he's, he's a minister now. I think I drove him into it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, that's, that's amazing. You uh, asked, I wasn't going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. <laughs> I really love when authors put jokes in authors name in character names and um, not to talk about Terry Pratchett too much, but in, uh, there is the dwarven wep weapons manufacturers, burly and strong in the arm, and it's it's I laugh every time. Um, so we have uh, some audience questions as well. Uh, Isabella wants to know: Will we ever be able to see more interaction between Artemis and Zeke coming up? Uh, Jaraxel pointed out their similarity, and it would be interesting to see them interact and compare experiences. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> well, I don't know. This might be the last so book, much. in which case it'd be no. But yeah, I love, I, I, I have to do a, I, 
even if I don't put it in a book someday, I'll have to write something where I have Dritz and Artemis facing off against Jarl Axel and Zach Nefain in a, in a, in a uh, fight, just to see, because that'd be fun. Chase wants- not, 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 not for, um, for real, but in a, because they're friends. They're all friends. <laughs> Chase wants to know, will Jarl Axel ever have a serious love interest? He's dating two dragons right now. What more do you want? Well, but That's pretty serious. Charles Axel, no. I, I mean, I couldn't see it because he's a complete hedonist. Uh, he, has, he has a love interest on the hour, every hour, every day. That's who he is. He's just, he's just out there. To have, he's living life large. One of my favorite lines in the books is um, Gromp and uh, Tiago Bayanre are having this argument, and Tiago is trying, this young, hotshot Tiago is trying to, is trying to, uh, you know, build himself up to the Archmage, Gromp. And he says, I've ridden a dragon. And Gromp says, I've eaten a dragon. And Jarl Axel's in the corner and he whispers, I've slept with a dragon too, actually. So there you go. That was good. Um, we have a question from Fred. Uh, Terry, what did you think of the Shannara series put out by MTV? And Bob, would you like to see the same things with the Dritz series? <laughs> I can answer for both of us, no. Or at least let me say why I said that. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted the adaptation I had to be like the books. I didn't think after the first season particularly, they got away from it completely, which I think is what probably killed the show. And Bob would love to see something done with Driss, but not if they're not gonna follow what he's doing in his writing, then it becomes, you know, somebody else's work. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I went into watching Shannara. My Elfstone's my favorite, my, one of my favorite books ever. And I, yeah. when I found out it was based on Elfstone's, I was like, lights off, popcorn, yeah. bourbon, ready to go. And and I enjoyed the first season, but they weren't when they were when they were deviating from the books the way they did. I was like, darn. Um, but yeah, it, I would, you know. I've been, there've been rumors of a Dritz movie or now series for 20 something years. Yeah, long time. And it, it just hasn't happened, but I don't know if you can see it behind me over there. I got the Funko Pop. We got Funko Pop finally. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of other things that are happening uh, with Dritz merchandise finally. And there's a video game coming out next year, a uh, AAA video game that's going to feature the Companions of the Hall where you can play four player, you can play Dritz, Caddy, Bree, Wolfgar, or Bruner. And you can play any of the four, and the AI will pick up the rest. Or you can multiplay it with four people. Um, it's uh, Dark Alliance, is, and it's, uh, it's either coming out later this year or early next year. It's called um, Dark Alliance from Toop Games. And actually, I think uh, Wizards of the Coast is publishing it. And I, I've seen it, and I've seen the work on I worked with them on the beginning um, story that they did for their vertical slice. And I love the guys at Took and they know the characters. So that makes me very, very happy. Uh, would I like to see a movie? Yeah. Um, maybe. Because they were going to do a movie once and they, 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 it was really actually getting kind of far along. Um, in, and they, they had a script and everything and they, they were pitching the script to me. And the first scene had Dritz in it and he was about to be guillotined or something. And this is how you introduce to him. And he's up in the, he's up in some mountain village or something. And he kicks the guillotine blade off the thing and he uses his weapon. And he fights his way through the village and escapes. And I said, well, he wouldn't do that because he'd be killing innocent people. He'd take the death before he'd do something like that. So there are certain lines that I, if, if they cross those lines with the motivations and personalities of the characters could really hurt. So that kind of scares me because I would have no control or very little control. That kind of stuff would scare me. Would I love to see a movie or TV show? As long as they were true to the characters and who those characters are, I'd love it. Of course, why not? I think uh, it's real hard to be, a, you know, the reason that Bob and I write books and not screenplays is because we kind of like to see it go through to how we envision it at the end, not just in the beginning. And uh, you can be almost certain that um, I thought I had a lot of control over what was going to happen on that Shannara show. 
And I found out that the only people who have control are one, the studios or the networks, and two, the people with the money. Yeah. So I'm going to take this opportunity to remind everybody who's attending this event that we, Bob, will be signing books at Gibson's Bookstore early next week. So if you would like to order a copy to have it signed and personalized, you may do so in the link that I'm dropping into the chat. Uh, Terry has also mailed us signed book plates, which we would be happy to tuck into any copy of Terry's books that you purchased from Gibson's Bookstore. Uh, some more questions. Eric asks, what is it like as an author to bring characters you've created in the 80s into 2020 successfully while keeping things dynamic and fresh enough for the reader to want to stick with them without feeling like, oh, I've read this plot before? Okay, Terry, you're up. <laughs> Well, as the writer who's been published since the 70s, uh, I can tell you that uh, there's definitely changes over a 50 year span uh, in the way that people relate to characters. But fantasy by and large is pretty bulletproof on this front. It's, it's pretty timeless, especially if you're writing epic fantasy. It hasn't changed all that much since the time of Tolkien and before then. Uh, so it's not so hard to do. I think what changes is your focus. You know, um, I had different concerns, different things I wanted to talk about 20 years now. Uh, so what I'm writing about now is and what interests me now, like Bob was talking about earlier, what interests me now is what I want to write about now. And uh, so you can't do it in a static sort of fashion. Uh, you have to have a underlying uh, set of uh, concerns or uh, story modes that you're working with uh, that is going to propel the story along with whatever the quest happens to be. My, uh, my answer is a little different. I agree with most of what Terry said. For me, it's a little different because from the beginning, when I did the Dark Elves, the, there was this, there was this like, ongoing argument that has become very relevant in recent years, is it nature or nurture with the Dark Elf society? When I wrote the Dark Elves, I based them on the five families of New York from Mario Puzo's The Godfather. And it's, so it, be, it became really important. This is why I said I'm glad this book is coming out right now because I think it's important in the scheme of things. It's a fantasy book, but I think it's important anyway. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, that I got to say that who the drow really are and how they started and what, what really went on down there to, to make them who they are. And, um, but other than that, characters change and you just go along with them and they will naturally change to go along with the events of the world, I think. Because you do, as a writer. And the characters, they're in your head and they're, they're made up characters, but there's a part of you that goes into making them up every time you sit down to write them. And it's funny because I'm one of those guys, I said I was a pantser, never more than with characters. I'll be writing a story about the character and he's completely out of character. And instead of saying, I got to fix that, I want to know why, what's bugging him. And it's kind of, that's kind of a weird part of the journey. And I did this with Catherly, my priest in the cleric quintet. It took me three books to realize that what was bugging him is that he was a priest who was getting all his magical powers from a deity, supposedly, but he was agnostic. And that was his conflict. I think something else uh, where Bob and I had differed right from the beginning is that Bob has always had a central character. I mean, the yeah. Dritz books are the Dritz books, any way you look at it. And that's the character everybody loves and wants to see more of. I remember writing about families and magic of a certain sort and an evolution that goes with it. So I am freed up to do something a little bit different with the characters. And by that, I mean, like, for example, with Al-Anon and the first three books, he was a very self-centered, confident, uh, you know, organized person. Uh, and as a druid, he never had any doubts about himself. In the next set of books, you have Walker Bow, who has all kinds of doubts about himself and doesn't function well at all. And then we go from there so that the central figure is a different druid with different issues all the way through. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I connect with better 
than I, I could ever do dress, for example. You start talking about, can one of us do the other's characters? I couldn't do dress because, you know, I can read him in a second, but I can't write him because I don't have that kind of staying power with a single character. But see, that's how I do my Demon Wars books, which you just described. Sure. Where the seven book Demon Wars series, the original series, um, of the original cast of about 20 or so major characters, I think one of them makes it all the way through. And every book is changing. So I, I get that. I get that. Dritz has been a, it's been a weird thing with Dritz. I didn't even know how it, how it kind of stuck around all that time, but it did. But it, with me, I mean. But it did. I just kept going back to him. And Well, don't you think and, you identified with him on uh, different levels and that uh, you wanted to know more about him and he would be the catalyst for all the things that happened? At least that's the way I read him. Yeah, and I think, it, uh, you know, I think really sealed the deal for me was after I had done the original trilogy when they said, we want you to do a trilogy and tell us where we came from. Mm -hmm. I started doing those, the beginning of each section, I do the Dritz essay where it's like a two, it's a one to four page, almost diary entry for him in first person where he's talking to himself. And I think that just drew me more and more into the character and drew him into me more, if you will. And then I went back and actually put those in the first books. They weren't in the first trilogy originally, they were later on. And so I, I think that's a big part of why that character stays so alive to me. The other thing with the Dritz series is he has, you know, he's got probably uh, 10, 12 companions that are around him at different times in the series and all different bad guys. And with the Dritz series, if, if you put, if you put a hundred people in a room who had read all the Dritz books and you said, who's your favorite character in the books? A, a fair number, a few would say Dritz, but a lot of them would say Jarl Axel. A lot of them would say Intrary. A lot of them would say Zach Nathan. A lot of them would say Pickle. A lot of them would say Caddy Bree. A lot of them would say Dahlia. A lot of them would say Intrary, definitely Intrary. Uh, others would say Thibbledorf Quint. It's got to be Thibbledorf Quint. Others would say it's got to be Athrigate. He's so cool, you know, and Camuriel, someone just said. And it's like, so the other characters have all like stepped up. And what three of the Dritz books don't have Dritz in them at all. The, um, and they were some of the most fun, the Cell Swords books is Jarl Axel and Intrary, and they were, they were a blast. They were just a blast to write. Talk about buddy fantasy. It was, uh, I was, I was, I was playing my Fritz Leiber fantasies there because I love, I love Fafford and Grey Mouser. So, you know, I, and I think that's what keeps it fresh, but Dritz keeps it grounded because of those essays. Because even in the books he's not in, he does the essays. See, back to what we were talking about earlier, this is why you should continue to write <laughs> about Dritz and about this series, because you're still invested in it. And you still have something to say, but I really have run out of things to say about the genre series uh, and stories to tell, at least for now. Um, and I knew what my ending was going to be and my own ending may be coming before I know it. And I don't want to end up having it unfinished uh, when I head on out to those happy hunting grounds. So I decided to end it now and then go back later if I get the urge and write it then. I but you're a young a, I thought we had a deal that if either of us goes unfinished, the other finishes it. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better writer to do it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. I would feel the same way, Terry. Make sure you send me a copy, will you? <laughs> I'll bring one with me. <laughs> I'll send you my forwarding address. There you go. <laughs> so we have, uh, Bob, we have some questions about Zach, Zach Nafin. Um, Zach Nafin. Zach Nafin. Zach Nafin. Zach Nafin. Or Zeke Nafin. We, the, or there's, Guinevere. there's no point in a glossary. There's many different ways to pronounce it. Uh, so someone asked, uh, Emilio asked, any thoughts on doing a book about Dritz's father? They both faced similar challenges, but why did Dritz's father stay when his son was brave enough to leave? And then Camilla asks, can you help me understand why Zach Nafin displays such racism in the current trilogy? In the original, he says, Zach Nafin Dwarden, I am called, yet a drow I am not, by choice or by deed, then goes on to describe how his kind may strike him down. And yet in the current trilogy, he believes these same drow are somehow superior. Thoughts? Yep. Those are great questions. First of all, the new series is about Zach Nafin, as much as anyone. And it real and the, the in 
each book I go back to two of the four sections and I'm talking about Zach and Gerald Axel before Drizzt is born. So you can see that progression. Now, as to why he's racist in these books, he's not really, at least not malignantly. And what I used as a guide on this, and I grew up with a dad who was Mr. Italian American, but we're American first, right? Fought in World War II, was wounded in Cherbourg. Um, you know, red, white, and blue dad, Italian, Italian neighborhood. But he was in an Italian neighborhood that's very old school. But my dad wasn't. My dad thought Muhammad Ali was one of the was one of the greatest philosophers of the '60s. My dad teared up with joy when Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists at the Olympics, and I, I thought he was mad. And I said, well, "You know, what do you think about that?" Because I was like 10 years old. We were watching the Olympics together, and he said, "I think he said I didn't go to Europe to fight for a piece of cloth. I went to fight for what it stands for, and that's what it stands for." And my point is, my dad with five daughters, was very progressive for his day. But if you took my dad, who died in 1984, and you plopped him into 2020, he'd be, he'd be out of sorts. He would be not know what to make of the world. And that's where Zach Nefane is. So he's kind of like Archie Bunker. He's been put in, I mean, he's a drow. All he ever knew were drow. And he hated the Spider Queen, and he hates the matron mothers. But that's the whole world he knew for three, four hundred years of life. Now he comes back, doesn't even know why he came back, doesn't even know where he was before, other in the years he was dead, if you will. And he's plopped into a situation on the surface world where he can barely stand the sight of the sun because he's, his whole life was spent in the underdark to find out that his son is married to a human. He's probably only seen one or two humans in his previous existence, if he saw any at all, and she's pregnant. And he's like, what is going on here? And he wouldn't be. Oh, that's cool. You know, everything's cool. No problem. Everything's great. He wouldn't be. And even Dritz, when he came to the surface, if you remember in the early books, The Legacy of the Drow, he made a vow that he would never kill a drow again. And it took him a while to realize that, that was racist because he's killed humans. He's killed dwarves in battle, but he wouldn't kill a drow. That's racist. And it took Dritz several books to, before he could accept that about himself. So Zach Defane's in the same situation. So I see him there and he's trying to make light of it, and he's, he's making jokes that kind of aren't singing, and they, he's just making everybody mad at him. He's trying. But it doesn't, it's not something that would happen in the real world. Again, my dad was a wonderful guy. And for his day, one of the things that bothers me about the world today is when people say, oh, you're woke, or you're not woke. Well, nobody's woke. We're all supposed to be waking all the time. This is the whole point of being alive. It's called evolution. It's learning, learning better, being better. You want to be a better person at the end than you were at the beginning. That's the point. But it bothers me a lot when people go back in time with anybody to like the 70s and the 60s and they pull something that this person might have said or did and they, he's a racist, he's this, he's that. The world was, I grew up in the 60s and 70s and I got to tell you something, the world was an incredibly different place. When I started writing the Dritz books, the luckiest break I got, in addition to having, I had three lucky breaks. I had Larry Elmore do the first cover of The Crystal Shard, which was amazing, because Larry Elmore is amazing. Had forgotten realms over the, my name, so people picked it up and read it. And I had a woman editor, Mary Kirchhoff. When I turned in the first draft of The Crystal Shard, there were no women in it that had a name. And Mary Kirchhoff said to me, Bob, there's no named women in this book. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's a frontier town. And she's like, hey, don't play that game with me, pal. And we're about the same age, and I totally respected her, and she just beat me up over that. So my daughter, Caitlin, was born 15 days before I turned in the Crystal Shard, and I wrote, Kate, her name is Caitlin Brielle. I wrote Caddy Bree into the book. And 
what I realized as I look back on that now is it was sexist. I was a sexist. And so were my five sisters because we all thought that's just the way the world is. And it's, it's kind of a mutual agreement. No, it's not, but we thought it was. So look, you, you got to grow. Zach Defane got put out of sorts by two centuries and put into a civilization that he had never had a whiff of before in the cultural, I mean, look at the books, right? I mean, you got a, my, my five friends, a barbarian human guy, a dwarf, who's the father of the barbarian human adopted, and the father of a human daughter, a halfling, and a drow, and the human and the drow are married. To Zach Defane's mind, growing up in Menzo Berenzan, what the hell is going on? So give him time. He's a good guy. He really is a good guy. You got to give him time to evolve a little bit. Well, I can say that. There you go. An amazing answer, and the chat is absolutely loving that. So I'm a, I'm a little speechless about where to go with that one. So that. You noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> really. Hey, look. You know. It, <laughs> Yeah, Bob it's not a, an answer I would have ever given a few years ago, but now you get me going and I'll roll. I'll be your Huckleberry. That was fantastic. Okay. Whew. All right. Okay. I'm just going to go to my prepared questions now because so because I just... Okay. So um, I'll ask each of you, what was your best, uh, best um, fandom moment where you met somebody that you admire and you had a little uh, a, fan, a fan moment? Oh, well, we met someone we admired? And then afterwards, what was your best fan interaction where someone met you? Oh, well, I have two. You, you, tell you go first. <laughs> you go first. Go ahead, Terry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I, will, I have something. Uh, it has nothing to do with writing, though. The most interesting person I ever met uh, in person was, uh, was Opie. Ronnie Howard? Yeah. Yeah, I want to meet Ronnie Howard. I love Ronnie he's, Howard. He's, you know, he's not that, he's up in my age bracket, and he's still Opie. You know, he looks the same, and that just floored me completely. And I found out uh, that he is he's one of the few people uh, in the movie business who is one hell of a nice guy and is exactly like he appears in back in the days of Andy Griffin. He's just that guy. My favorite movie is American Graffiti. Yeah, me too. I love that movie. Yeah. I know. You know, uh, meeting Bob was, uh, uh, I, I won't say that's the most stunning moment in my life uh, for meeting somebody, but it was certainly a great moment because uh, we have had this friendship all these years. Yeah. Um, and we have, I, I don't think we've ever gotten upset with each other except once uh, during a certain Super Bowl, but we, we won't talk about that today. Uh, but other than that, <laughs> oh, he should have run the ball, Terry. He should have run the ball. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Patriots fan. He's a you know, he's you, a hot you, guy. you the, when you meet another writer and you and it, I have a lot of a lot of respect for other writers, um, and I have a real interest to know about them because um, this is what I do, and I like to understand why other people do this. To me, it's a constant mystery. Uh, and when you meet somebody you connect with, like with Bob and myself, um, it opens a lot of doors uh, to understanding that you might not find otherwise. And you form these attachments that are just terrific. That's true. That's true. Well, I've got a couple that I can rip right through. Um, and probably the first one was Terry. And I'm not just saying that because he's here. I went to the book signing. He was the first really accomplished author I had ever met. And I loved his stuff. And I was nervous. And I was nervous because more than just, I was nervous because I was meeting a famous person. I was nervous because what happens when you meet a first famous person and they turn out to not be a good person? True. And, and I've had that experience, but not often. I can say I haven't had that experience often. So I, I loved that meeting at the bookstore in Lemonster. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I, I very much enjoyed and I'm sure Terry, you'll back me up on this. I very much enjoyed working with George Lucas and meeting yeah. George Lucas because yeah. I met George Lucas on the day after the 2000 election. And he came into the office storming because, you know, it, was it Bush? Was it Gore? Was it Bush? Was it Gore? 
and I was supposed to be in there for 45 minutes, but I think he, it was refreshing to him because I was really grilling him on the script for Attack of the Clones. And I think that was refreshing to him. And we were supposed to meet 45 minutes and four hours later, we were downstairs and he was showing me the director's cuts of parts of the movie. It was amazing. Um, so that was, that was incredible. And, and I've met him a few times since, and he was just so generous with his time. And, you know, this is George Lucas, right? <laughs> and yeah, and, and that, so uh, that was a really wonderful experience. And the third one was, was um, Peter S. Beagle. Hmm. Peter S. Beagle wrote the, the last unicorn, right? But he wrote the forward in the Ballantine Hobbit and Lord of the Rings series that came out in the 70s. And that forward, as much as the books made me remember why I used to read, it was a wonderful forward. And, and I just admired it so much in the way he did it. And he was on a tour just a few years ago for the, um, the, the Last Unicorn Tour. So they were touring through movie theaters around the country, came to my hometown. So a friend and I went down to see him. And he's, you know, he's an older gentleman now. And I couldn't believe they were doing this bus tour around the country. And I figured he was going to be grumpy and everything. And I was really nervous because this was one, this was the guy who, that was the first thing I had read when I was in college that made me change my major from math, computer science, physics to creative, uh, to um, technical writing. So I could start taking lit courses. And so it was big thing was because of what he said in that, in that small forward to those books. Google, it's online. It's brilliant. He was the nicest guy. He was, he, we've talked for like two hours, like one in the morning and he's got to get on a bus and go to Canada or wherever they were going next. He was, and it was just, and we left there and my friend looked at me and he goes, man, it's like he knew you for 50 years. That was amazing. And I'm like, I know. So that really touched me. But those are the three that really stand out for me. There's been, a, oh, I'm, and one day I'm doing a book signing and Kurt Schelling called me up. Come create a, help me create a computer game world. That was kind of weird and different. Among other things. It started out really well. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> we are running out of time and we have about 50 questions from fans, which we're not going to get to, but I do want to get to this question from Coral. Coral has donated, purchased a copy for, uh, a, a copy which will be signed at Gibson's Bookstore, which you all have the chance to win in a raffle. I'm going to drop the link here into the chat. Um, you can nominate, you, you nominate somebody for this, you may nominate yourself. And Bob will be drawing them when he comes, uh, the winner when he comes to Gibson's to sign. So it will be drawn at random. Coral asks, what do you do when you find your characters talking too much in order to include exposition? How do you diversify that scene? Harry? This is your show. You go. You go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want me to go first? I'm just a guest. Yeah. No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, then I'll correct you. Yeah, my, my, my character's... If, if Dritz is talking too much, I turn that into an essay at the beginning of the section. <laughs> I just, I'm done that. Um, no, I, I, the, I, I always will break it up. I prefer the books to stay fast paced and a, a thick paragraph of dialogue can slow something down unless there's a reason for it. Like it's a let's go get them speech that has to be given type of thing. Um, but I, I don't, I don't really have a problem with that. It, they, they, I like banter and banter goes back and forth. I prefer that. So like if I'm doing that in Trary and Jarlaxle, for example, neither of them is going to let the other talk for long. They're just not. I think uh, you have to remember what Elmore Leonard said about uh, cutting uh, parts out of books that you tend to skip over uh, because there's nothing happening. Um, and he was the master of getting right to the point all the way through. And I kind of bear that in mind with conversation uh, because with conversation, you better be getting to a particular point and it better lead to some kind of uh, conflict issue uh, that is going to pop up later or a, a better understanding of the character. Uh, and unless you're working with Versilimitude or 
uh, perhaps an understanding of the situation, you better not overdo the conversation part because people, you know, we're not writing conversation. Uh, that's, that's literary fiction. We're writing uh, adventure stories and adventure stories, like Bob says, they got to move. There's got to be something happening. And uh, after a page or two, people are going to say, hey, how about getting to the point? And uh, that is one of the faults, in my mind, a major fault of a number of writers in our own field, that they tend to have too much going on with nothing happening, you know, page after page sometimes. And Bob and I have talked about this at length without naming names, but it's irritating to me to get into a book where I'm forced to read endlessly and nothing is going on. Uh, I want them to get a story and, and put it out there and let me enjoy it and then let me go to bed. Yeah, uh, just to pick up on that real quick, when I was in England many years ago for the launch of the Rock book line in, in the UK, uh, I was with a guy named Tom DeHaven, a writer named Tom oh, DeHaven, I know Tom, wonderful yeah. guy. He's wrote a great. book called Walker of Worlds, just, just a great guy. And, and we hit it off big time, but we were doing an interview with BBC. And I remember they asked them at that time, why our books were more popular than Tolkien's in the UK. This was before the movies and the Tol um, probably the biggest reason is everybody in the UK probably owned the Tolkien books already. But um, Tom said something I've never forgotten that Tolkien grew up in his readership was pre TV. And so for, to me, to me to sit down and read a book like Moby Dick, I can't do it. I can't, I, it, it needs to go. I need the only book I've ever been able to read, of that style was probably uh, Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose hmm. because that was very slow and very descriptive on everything, but I just found it so fascinating what he was doing with it. So yeah, I'm the same way. It's like, I want to get going. I want to get to the point of it. I want to get, I want to keep it going fast. People are busy. People want to get through things and go on. Although I will tell you a lot of the new movies, there's a lot of movies that I don't like, and I won't say it publicly because a lot of my fans will probably hit me because I know a lot of my, my fans love these movies but there's a lot of movies i see today where all the characters ever do is say like one or two words and then pose with their weapon or something and it just it just it drives me crazy there has to be some insight into who they are with what they say uh all right so one more question and then we're going to do some rapid fire and wrap up this event bob amelia wants to know if zach nefane was the best swordsman in the world before dritz who trained zach nefane well, some of that's in the, no, it's not actually. Um, Zach DeFay trained himself. He's, he came up with, he comes up with his own techniques, which is what Dritz is doing now. Uh, so, I mean, he, he had a weapon master. I'm sure he trained, he went to Malin Mag Thayer, the Drow School for Martial Arts, basically. So he learned, you know, the basic things. But Zach DeFay, you'll see in one of the books, I think it was, I think it was in Boundless, where Zach DeFay will, he, he will work on one particular move because he knows somebody's trying to kill him. And he knows how this guy is going to try to kill him because he knows this guy's style. And he will work on this one move over and over and over again. And sure as heck. Because he knows, he knows he's, make, he's trying to make a combination. It's like a seven swing combination. And he knows he's only got a couple of eye blinks to do it. So he trains his mu muscles over and over and over again for that expected attack. And it happens. And he executes it. And that's, I know when I used to box in high school, and I had to fight a lefty once who was 6'7". He's still a dear friend of mine, Colin Hazard. Colin, if you're watching, still love you, buddy. And we were going to box in Rocco Cellar. We had a gym set up. And, and, I, and Colin was 6'7". He was lanky. He wasn't that big, but he had these arms that could reach across the ring. And I had to think about how I was going to approach that fight. Because if I had just gone in there, my right, boom, right through the gloves every time with that left hand of his, that was lethal. So I had to train and train and train to be able to stand there up against him for a while. It was a heck of a fight. I don't remember much of it. He doesn't either. It was a heck of a fight. <laughs> 
All right. So uh, our, we'll mention one last time that signed books of Bob's will be available from Gibson's Bookstore. If you'd like to order a copy of a book, we will have it signed next week. Terry's books will include a signed book plate. Um, let's do some rapid fire. Questions. My books can be personalized too, right? Yes. 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 If you include a short personalization on the order form. Um, we can include that. Terry's books will include a signed book plate. So I'm going to drop that link one more time and we will include that in uh, follow up emails. Let's do some rapid fire questions to close out this event. Uh, for each of you, what do you prefer for snacks, salty or sweet? Salty. salty. Not even close. I could eat 10 bags of chips and not even blink. You did eat 10 bags. Yeah, this morning. It's COVID. Man. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of food, describe your ideal sandwich. <laughs> wow. My wow. ideal sandwich? Either of you. Pulled pork. Oh, pulled pork is good. For me, I, I think I'd have to go with um, tuna melt. That's good too. And I love tuna melts. What's the last book you bought for the cover? For the cover? Never. Yeah. Never. No, I don't buy for the cover. No. Uh, what's the first thing you're going to do post COVID when you can go out and do whatever you want? I could be um, dead by then. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's the first? I, I think probably, probably go out to a fine dining restaurant. I miss going out to uh, sit down and be waited on and be treated nicely for an evening with all the accoutrement. For me, it depends. for me, it depends what coast I'm on. If I'm oh, out yeah. here, if I'm out here, it'll probably be um, go out with the family, a big restaurant gathering with everybody. If I'm out in California, it'll be go down the beach. Go down, go down to Hermosa Beach and just hang because that's one of my favorite places in the world. But no matter where it is, the first thing we're going to be doing as this thing ends, uh, yeah, is, is we're going to be planning the Disney trip with my entire family that we had to cancel in March. And the, every fall I go to Disney with my sisters, with my sister, my sister-in-law, my other sister, and my brother-in-law. Um, and we go to Disney every year and for food and wine at Epcot. And that will be, that will be, food and wine is amazing. It really is. I just, the, I picture this and I picture you eating at, uh, you know, Mickey's Cafe or something. Uh, no, than, <laughs> no, food and wine at Epcot is a whole different Mark, level. Sure? That's actually fine dining. And, but we go every year and it's, and it, I, I, I'm really sad that we had to cancel that one too because we were supposed to go every November. We had to obviously cancel this year as well. And my sisters, you know, we're all getting old. <laughs> and I don't know how many more years we're going to be able to do it. So that'll be one of the first things we plan. Okay. Um, and last question to close out the event. Any books that you read recently that you'd like to uh, mention to our audience at home? Well, I read a book by a new author named Alex Harrow called uh, Once in Future Wishes that was just terrific. I enjoyed that a great deal, uh, and I just finished, uh, uh, which isn't even out yet. Well, neither is that one, but uh, another arc, which you get all the time, uh, uh, by uh, Naomi Novik, that is absolutely blockbuster, and I can't even tell you any more about it, but it's a terrific book. Bob? I just... Um... I just started two books and I'm enjoying both of them. One is uh, Rage of Dragons, Evan Winter's book. And the other is City of Brass, Shannon uh, Chakabody's first book in the trilogy she just finished. And I wasn't, I don't usually read a lot of fantasy anymore because it just interferes too much with my writing. Um, but I took a chance on these two. One, because I had this conversation with Evan not long ago, and that he was wonderful to talk to, and he gave me some great insights into things I was doing with the Dark Elf books, actually, which was wonderful. And Shannon's, it's because I, I met her at a signing, and she is so much in love with the culture and the mythos that she's describing. I just, I just had to see more. And so far, I'm not disappointed with either one. And the book I just finished that scared the hell out of me is a political book by Sarah Kenzior called um, hiding, uh, 
hiding in plain sight, which um, I think is kind of important, an important book, but it's scary as hell. Yeah, I just read one of those about the pandemic. Which one was that? Oh, I can't think of his name. It's something in October. Last until October or something like that. And of course, it's, it's exactly what's happening in the world right now. Yeah. So uh, that was a little terrifying. Somebody was able to presage the future on this thing. Although, if he's right, we're all toast. Oh, I don't want to read that one. <laughs> I know. That's what I thought after I finished it. It was, why did I read this book? All right. Well, I hope to never read that, and I hope we don't live it. Uh, so the end of October, someone says. It, it, yeah, Sean just yeah the end of, that's it, the end of October. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Bob, for joining us. Thank you, Terry, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, joining us from home. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I will be very pleased if we can do this again, perhaps later in the year. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great evening. Bye. Bye, all.